Hallelujah. Romans chapter number two. How about that? <laughs> if you're visiting, we've been in Romans 1 38 years. <laughs> Our shoes haven't worn out, our same clothes. But... Romans chapter number two, you might not be so happy. <laughs> Read these first three verses. Therefore, on the basis of everything that we read in chapter 1, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, and everybody does, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. God said that before you were born. God said, before, said that before I was born. He knows that everyone who will ever read the Bible judges other people for doing things they do. It just, he didn't have to ask. He didn't have to watch you. He knew ahead of time. He could prophesy that every person who walked this earth would find fault with other people for things they, they do in their own lives. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Father, bless your word, please, to our hearts this morning. Help us, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name and amen. Now, who is without excuse? Some writers have read and studied Romans 2 and concluded the subject or the object of the chapter is the Jew. And others have read and studied and commented they believe the object of the chapter is the Gentile. And others say perhaps it's the saved Jew and the saved Gentile which make up the church. And, and, and so they go round and round trying to support their arguments. Here it's real simple. Watch. Therefore thou art inexcusable. Whosoever thou art. That kind of settle that. If you're part of the human race, God says, I'm talking to you. Whoever you are, I'm talking to you. There's people here. So I was with a, a pastor in Idaho a couple of weeks ago, and I told him, I said, our, our church on Sunday morning looks like a, a meeting of the United Nations. And, and I appreciate that. I'm glad God saves everybody of every background and race and color and creed and all of that. If you trust Christ your Savior, He'll save you and, and you'll, you'll fall in love with Christians and Christians will fall in love with you. Praise the Lord. There's one gospel for everybody in the world because everybody in the world is equally guilty before God. And we are equally guilty of knowing that sin should be paid for and punished when other people do it but not wanting it to be judged and punished and paid for when we do it. And the Lord said, you don't have an excuse because you proclaim every day, you profess every day that you know right from wrong when you see other people do wrong. But somehow when, when I do wrong and when you do wrong, it's not as easily recognizable. And so the Lord says, let me recognize it for you. If you can't see it in yourself, I'll point it out to you. Looking in the second verse, this is a very unusual thing for the day and time in which we live, but we are sure that the judgment of God is. You know, there are not too many people left in town that are sure the judgment of God is. They don't think he judges the grossest of sins. They don't think he judges the most oft-repeated sins. They don't think he judges the most hurtful of sins, much less the ones I commit or you commit. But those who agree with the Word of God, written in the Holy Bible, 
We are sure that the judgment of God is. There are still things that God says people shouldn't do. There are still things that people says God should do. And God still says when someone does something they shouldn't do, they're wrong. And when someone does something they, or does not do something they should do, they are wrong. This world doesn't want to go to a church where they're told that anything they're doing is wrong. They don't want to be friends with anyone who is telling them that something they are doing is wrong because it's judgmental and it's hateful and it doesn't show any love. And they manifest that by saying, I think your church is wrong. I think you're wrong. And God says, excuse me. You don't believe in judging, but you judge my Bible, and you judge my church, and you judge my people. And you don't believe that anything is wrong, but you talk all day about how wrong those people are who are trying to tell you you need Jesus. God says, that's, that's inexcusable. It's not acceptable to me that you have a standard of judgment from you toward everyone else, but you will not allow a standard of judgment from me, a holy God, towards you. Then he says in that second verse, we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. The basis of judgment is not what the Republicans believe or what the Democrats believe or what a liberal believes or what a conservative believes. It's in accord with truth. And there's only one who ever, always, without fail, speaks truth. Titus 1.15 says, God cannot lie. The president can, the last president can, the next president will. People lie. Mothers lie, fathers lie, children lie, people, people lie. God cannot lie. If he, if he, he wouldn't, but if he tried to tell a lie, he couldn't do it. Because there's nothing God can't do. Sure there is. He cannot lie. Jesus said, I am the truth. He didn't say I am the truth in footnote most of the time. In footnote whenever I'm able to tell the truth. He's truth. So what Jesus Christ did is the basis of judgment. What Jesus Christ said is the basis of judgment. What Jesus Christ taught is the basis of judgment. We don't think we're right and everybody else is wrong. We think Christ is right and everybody else is wrong. The Bible's right and everybody else is wrong. You understand this morning, and this, this will sound very judgmental. It is. You realize this morning the majority of congregations that assemble today in a building that is called a church are meeting in a place where the leadership has decided God was wrong. Maybe God was wrong when he said that his word was without error. Maybe God was wrong when he said that people should be married if they're going to live together. Maybe God was wrong when he, when he defined what a marriage should be. Maybe God was wrong when he said thou should not steal. But, but you have entire denominations whose leaders have voted or sanctioned or institutionalized positions contrary to what God said in the Bible. We are certain that the judgment of God is not according to what a Baptist says or a Catholic says or a Lutheran says or a Methodist says. The judgment of God is according to truth. Romans 10, 17 says, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. We don't believe that God is going to judge us or that we are to judge one another on the basis of our opinion or a majority opinion. On the basis of truth. That second verse says, We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against. Well, that just got God run out of the conversation. That just got, got, just got God put out of the social circle. Let news flash. Breaking news. God is against. He can't be for life and for murder. He can't be for normal and for perverted. 
He can't be for raising children in the nursery and admonition of the Lord and harming little children. He can't be for telling the truth and lying. We are sure the judgment of God is against. There are things that are clearly spelled out in the Bible that people should not do, and when those things are done, God is against those things. You can't have a sane life unless you have a God who's against things that would rob you of your sanity. You can't have a safe life unless you have a God who's against things that would take away your safety. This notion in this, these modern times that we have to find a church and a minister and a God who's not against anything, that's why your society is in the danger that it's in. You're not safe in broad daylight. You're not safe in your home. Why? Because you have a bunch of Darwinian evolutionary animals who don't think there is a God, and if there is a God, he's not against anything they do. We are sure that the judgment of God is against you stealing another man's wife, you harming a, a woman's child, you, you uh, robbing a, a, a widow lady of her, of her income. Come on, how long a list do you want? Then he says, we are sure the judgment of God is according to truth against them. Here's a, here's a myth. So oft repeated, people think it's in the Bible. Well, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. No, he's pretty much against the person that does the things he's against. The judgment of God is against them that do these things. He's against them that do such things. Everybody's not on good terms with God. Everybody's not God's child. God's not going to make everybody a superstar. If, if God says don't kill and you murder somebody, he's not just against murder, he's now against you. God said thou shalt not commit adultery and you, you are unfaithful to your husband or your wife. God's not just against the principle, he's against you for doing it. Now here's, here's, how, he, here's how God said, I know that you know this is true. Because if it's done to you, you judge it as wrong. But if you do it to me, you say, I'm supposed to be okay with it. And that's why I can't excuse your behavior. Because you can't say, I didn't know it was wrong. Because when somebody else did it, you testified that you knew it was wrong. I can't believe that guy did that. That's, that's just so awful. I'm, I'm going to write about it on my Facebook. I'm going to give him a thumbs down. So let me see if I get this right. When that man did something that didn't meet with your approval, you wanted to judge him privately and publicly. Because in your judgment, he deserves to be blacklisted or criticized or, or brought to repentance or, or shown the error of his ways. And God says, well, so how come when I have a Christian friend or a Christian family member or a preacher or my Bible show you there's something wrong in your life, you get all bowed up and say, I don't believe you should judge. But you do believe in judging, as long as it's coming from your throne to your subjects, but not if it's coming from God's throne, your direction. And you say, well, I would never do that. Thou art inexcusable, O man. You would, you do. I would, I do. We all do. We all do. God said, I'm just... He's not even trying to get you to stop judging other people because you can't. He's not even trying to get you to say it's wrong to judge other people because it might not be. He's just asking you to admit that you believe in judgment and that you believe that things that are done that are incorrect or inappropriate are going to be judged and should be judged. He's asking you to agree with that so you can prepare for the day when he judges you. 
He's not arguing against your practice of saying that shouldn't be worn. You're right. Those words shouldn't be used. You're right. Those deeds shouldn't be committed. You're right. It's not wrong to judge. You need to sit down with your children and put your arms around them and say, we don't do that and here's why. We don't go there and here's why. We don't engage in those activities and here's why. You have to judge or you're crazy. God's not telling you to stop doing that. He's asking you, if I made you in my image and I put enough sense in you to judge hurtful and wrong behavior so that it didn't ruin your life, how can you think that I don't judge hurtful and wrong behavior? Look at yourself. Look at how you're made. I made you in my image. You think I'm just going to watch you do all this stuff and not say anything about it? Now look at the third verse. Then thinkest thou this, O man. See, God knows how people think. Long before you ever had a thought. God wrote in Romans 60 AD. Okay, I, I know what you're thinking. And when you read it, that's why the Bible spooks people like it does. That's why it's, people are scared of it. Because it reads their mind. God knows you inside. Now, no other book in the world knows you inside and out like this. You never read a, a novel or, a, or a, you know, some internet blog about politics and thought, man, that guy, know, he knows exactly what's going on in my heart. And boy, you read this Bible, it's, it's scary how much God knows about us. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? <laughs> you said that's wrong, and you're a sinner. How about God who's holy? How do you think he feels about it? If you know it's wrong, and you declare it's wrong, and you pronounce judgment upon it because it's so wrong, you think you're going to stand before somebody who's absolutely righteous? And he's going to say, oh, that's not a big deal. I mean, you, <laughs> your standard was higher than mine. Your expectations were higher than mine. I really didn't care. I don't think so. We've got to change that way of thinking. Turn with me in your Bible. Just, just a couple of verses real quickly. Uh, James chapter 2. James chapter number 2. This generation needs to get over the improper thinking that when I judge someone's misconduct, that's an acceptable act. But if God were to judge someone's misconduct, he'd be a bad God. That's just somebody trying to make money off you in the name of religion. You know, you know if there's a God, he can't be less righteous than you are. <laughs> you, you know if there's a God, he, he can't be more concerned about the way people harm one another than you are. You got that right. James chapter 2, verse number 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Hang on to that thought. He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Now he's not warning you that, that you can get out of being judged by God. We're all going to be judged by God. He's saying you can prepare for that judgment by judging more correctly in advance of that great and terrible day. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter number 12. Similar thought, different place. Matthew 12, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. All right, now stay with me. Luke 19, verse 22. Luke 19, verse 22. We're in the Bible. The Bible's good for us. 
Good for us. We need the Bible. Luke 19, 22. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Now, we have three cases here. Two of them told by Jesus Christ directly. One of them told by Jesus Christ through James the Apostle. In all three places he said this. When someone sinned against you, you were so harsh, you were so angry, you were so indignant, you, you wanted that person to repent because they'd sinned against you. And whenever somebody tries to talk to you about Jesus and you need to be saved, you get all crazy. Like God is not upset with you for sinning against him. And God doesn't expect repentance for, uh, from you when you sinned against him. Come on, think about this. This morning, hundreds of people made a late run through the yellow light and caused someone to nearly collide with them or to have to stop and miss themselves getting through the yellow light just before it turned red. And none of those bothered you. But when that guy pulled in front of you, it's instant. You don't have to prime the pump. I can't believe that guy did that. Look at that. To me. It's not that he charged the yellow light. It's not that somebody had to slam on the brakes. It's that you had to hit the brakes. He pulled out in front of you. I've been sinned against. Somebody should do something about it. I wish there was a cop here right now. <laughs> then to make up for missing the light, the next three blocks, you're going 50 in a 35 zone, but you don't want the cop there for that. Because that's you. I got a right to speed because that guy pulled out in front of me and now I'm going to be late to get. <laughs> Someone this morning will be rubbed the wrong way in this building and you don't care unless it's you. And if it's you, it becomes an international crisis. Somebody's got to do something about that because it happened to me. And God says, I wish I could get you to understand that because I am God and the God and your God and these are my words and my commandments, you don't think it bothers me when you sin against me? I'm the recipient of man's transgressions. They're against my words. They're against my commandments. They're against my requests. And the Lord says, you're, you're missing out on a great opportunity to get right with me if you don't properly evaluate how you respond when you're sinned against. I'm trying to show you how I feel when you sin against me. And I'm trying to show you how fervently I desire for you to repent and make that right. But all you can see is that you got offended. Look at it. Come on. Look, look back at our passage. And I'll, I'll show you what it, exactly what I mean. Romans, Romans chapter 2. In verse 1, I am judging someone to condemnation because they did something that hurt me or someone I care about. In verse number two, I am sure that God should judge, uh, we're sure God would judge them that, commit, them that commit such things. Okay? When they do that, God should judge them. God is going to get those congressmen that steal all that money from the citizens. He's not going to get me from clocking out an hour early 
and stealing from my boss man. God is going to get those people that, that let their children just run wild all over the place in the store, but me neglecting my kids in my own home and not training them up according to the Bible, entirely different. I'm just saying, well, you, can, you can give a thousand of these. We're certain the judgment of God is against them. Not so sure against me. So he says in the third verse, why do you think they won't escape judgment, but you will escape judgment for, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Here's what happens. Some of you parents have told your children since they were were old enough to understand words. If you don't live for Jesus, there'll be terrible consequences. And when they're 19, 20 years old, they turn their back on you, they turn their back on the church, they turn their back on God, and they head out there in the world and do all the things you taught them not to do. And at 21, nothing happens. And they think, God doesn't care. They're 25 and nothing's happened. They think God doesn't care. They're 30 and nothing's happened. They think God doesn't care. And God said, you misunderstand how much I love you and how much I want to spare you from the wrath to come. You confuse that for I don't care. My patience in giving you space to repent, you take it to mean you're not doing anything wrong. And God said, I, I just want you to understand. I am going to deal with those sins. The fact that I haven't dealt with them yet is because I would like to deal with them in the person of my son, Jesus Christ, when you turn from those sins and trust him, rather than have to deal with you directly. But don't make the mistake of thinking that I don't care because I made you in my image and you care. Now again, we're, we're, not, we're not making God a sinner like ourselves. We're trying to understand the God of the Bible. Two kids in the neighborhood. One does something that breaks the rules. Another one is right there with him. The one that's not your son, somebody really needs to do something about that kid. The one that is your son, he probably just got talked into it. He probably, he's probably, he's probably not, the, you know, he's just in the wrong place, wrong time. Let's agree, let's agree. There's something in all of our hearts that wants those we love have another chance or the benefit of the doubt or every opportunity to get it worked out. Why? Because we just, we love them. Nobody else can figure out why, but that kid, well, if that was my kid, that's what they're saying about yours. Well, if that was my kid, I'd do something about that. Because, okay, so apply that. The fact that God has let something go in your life doesn't mean he's not against it. It means he would do anything he could to keep from having to sentence you to that terrible place called hell. He doesn't want to do it. Don't mistake the love of God for God not caring. Don't, don't mistake the patience and the long-suffering of God for God not going to do anything. So what do men do? Verse number five. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What do we do? By not repenting because nothing bad happened, by not repenting because no judgment has fallen yet, all we do is just pile up 
things for God to judge when we stand before Him and He's going to hit us all at once with all of it and people are just going to be shocked. Well, I never thought God would judge me for this. He said He would. I never thought God would punish this. He said He would. You thought He wasn't going to. You thought because you got away with it 10 times or 20 times or for 30 years, God wasn't interested. But he told you in the Bible, don't think that way. I am going to stand you up before me and judge those things. So come to me now and let's get it resolved. Come to me now and let's, let's make peace. So I don't have to do that. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter number 7. I was talking with one of our ladies for service and, and we were commenting on how far things have gone since my childhood. The things that were inappropriate and out of line 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you wouldn't even believe anyone was ever concerned about those things. We didn't have sheriffs to protect us against shooters. We had school patrol with orange belts to stop us from skipping steps. Six steps went into the side entryway of the Faulkner Street Elementary School and you could take them two at a time. It was just, it was easy. But if you did, you would have to run laps at PE because it was against the rules. You had to take them one step at a time. And why, I don't know. I don't know why because if you fell down the steps back then, you couldn't sue anybody. You just had to get up and hold your arm and try to not cry in front of your friends. It's just that's... They might call you a baby, and that would, that would ruin the whole day. We didn't have lectures on, in the second grade on which gender do you think you might really be. We were told why if you got, got caught putting gum under the top of the desk, you'd have to clean all the undersides of all the desks. It's a different world. But you know what's happened is our society has declined into the robbing and stealing and molesting and perverted mess that it is. Because God hasn't sent fire down from heaven or opened the earth and swallowed people up, they think he doesn't care. And the Lord said, you're making a big mistake. I'm patient. I'm long-suffering. I was going to destroy the world in a flood in Noah's day, and I waited 120 years hoping somebody else would get on that boat. And then I sent the flood I said I was going to send. Now look at James chapter 7. Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, Matthew 7. If you've got James 7 in your Bible, I want to see it. Um, <laughs> Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking, and he says in verse number 1, let, let's, let's say it the way the people who've never read it say it, judge not, that ye be not judged. <laughs> you have to say it with kind of a sneer. <laughs> For, and here's why he said it, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured you again. He just said, Here's why I don't want you to judge. Not because the other person's not wrong, but because you're showing me how to judge you. Verse 3, And why beholdest thou the moat? That's a little tiny splinter, a little tiny, tiny piece of wood. Why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? See this, see this here? You got that sticking out of your eye. But, but you're using your one good eye to say you got a splinter in your eye, man. What do you think about that? I think you ought to get that splinter out of your eye, man. 
And he, he didn't say you don't know you have a mote in your, a beam in your eye. He said you just don't consider it. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't have a beam in your eye and not be aware of it. It's just not a big deal. The big deal is that you got a splinter in your eye, man. That's terrible. Get the splinter out of your eye. <laughs> you got a six foot four by four sticking out of your other eye, but it's not a big deal. You know what people, you know, you know what people think? They think God's okay with that. When they stand before God, their beam is going to be all right because they're special. But boy, he's going to really let you have it for that moat. You see, you know what? There's no excuse for, for your thinking. There's no excuse for your lack of preparation for the judgment day. You believe little teeny tiny sins should be judged in the other guy. But great big giant sins shouldn't be judged if the other guy's judging you. And I'm going to take the proper standard of judgment, deal with them. Look at the next verse. <laughs> he says in um, verse number four, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Okay, so let, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but let's say this afternoon, uh, you're out wor working in the garage, and, and you got the power saw going, uh, and uh, like my wife, and your spouse is standing at the house yelling and saying, Put your goggles on! Can't hear you! <laughs> and you, you get a little piece of wood in your eye. And we rush you down to the eye doctor, and he walks in, and he's got a, he's got a golf club sticking out of his eye. And you lay down on the table, and he says, okay, let me get that. When he whacks you with a... <laughs> and he, he's, he's trying to get close enough to you get the splinter out of your eye. He's got this big thing sticking out. You say, get away from me, man. You're dangerous. You're crazy. It's not that people don't appreciate your constructive criticism. It's that you get this big giant thing sticking out of your eye and you're going to hit them in the head with it if you don't settle down. Let me help you with that sin in your life. Wham! Because <laughs> I got this big one in mine and it's not that I don't know it's there. He didn't say that. He said, I don't consider it. I'm used to it. I like it. It's not a big deal. You ever have a construction crew come and work, or you're, you're on, a, on a highway in your construction zone? You ever notice the cooler yeah. on the back of those work trucks? It's, it's got like 12 years of dirt caked on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and algae growing out of the spout. It's all green all over it. And those guys are drinking out of it every day because it's their cooler. They're so used to that cooler, it's not dirty to them. They don't consider it. And you walk up and say, uh, they say, you'd like a drink? No. <laughs> you look thirsty. Not that thirsty. I'm not drinking out of that cooler. Next time you're going to straighten your wife out or your husband out or your kids out, or your parents out, or your brother or sister in Christ, just remember what your cooler looks like to everybody else. Right. Hey, can I give you some water? No. It's living water. Don't care. Not if it's coming out of that. We're used to our sin. I'm used to mine. You're used to yours. To the point where we don't even consider it. God said, you know what, one day, one day, we're going to stand before someone who's never had a beam in his eye. We're going to stand before somebody whose cooler was spotless. And he's going to say, now, how was it again that you expected the guilty to be judged? That's right, no mercy. That's right. No tolerance. 
That's right, no understanding. Well, God, I don't want you to judge me that way. You just didn't think it would ever come to this. That's what he said. And I want you to understand. You believe in judgment, it's in your heart. You believe it should be against sin, it's in your heart. You believe it should be carried out swiftly and, and, and without mercy. It's in your heart. I made you in my image. I am going to judge sin. Mm, 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 mm. I don't know if I, if I like this preaching or not. I don't like it. <laughs> but it's the truth. All right, let's finish, up, let's finish up with this. Romans 2, Romans 2, and John chapter 3. Romans chapter 2, and John chapter 3. Here's what God wants. He doesn't want me to live and die in fear of judgment. He wants my fear of judgment to bring me to a place of salvation. Now look at Romans 2.1. Therefore thou art an excusable man, whosoever thou art the judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou, well, watch, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. You say, I just don't believe in a God that would condemn me. He doesn't. You condemn you. I condemn me. My condemnation is self-inflicted. God wants to save me from condemnation. Look at John chapter number 3. Here's a verse we know. Verse 16, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son to the world to condemn the world, See that? We do that ourselves by excusing our sin while finding fault with it in others. God sent not His Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now, what brings about condemnation? It's not that I sin. It's not that you sin. It's that when I have sinned, I excuse it, and I pardon it, and I expect that God will do the same. And that brings me into, keeps me locked into condemnation. God doesn't want me condemned. He sent his son Jesus Christ to die and pay for my sin. And Jesus said, come to me and I will free you from that condemnation. And what do people say when you witness to them? Oh, I don't think I need that. Then you stay condemned. Who are you to judge me? Then you stay condemned. I don't think God would do anything like that. Then you stay condemned. It's not God who does it to you. We do it to ourselves. They don't do it often anymore. There, there's so many ways to fix something up. But I, I remember frequently when I was younger, you'd, you'd drive past a, a house that's leaning this way and the porch is leaning that way and the part of the roof is gone and, and on the door it would say, condemned. And what that sign condemned meant is there is nothing more that any man can do to save this house. The only thing left is to tear it down. Now I know what could save that house. Not, not Bob the Builder. <laughs> not bringing in some crew from a TV show. If God, if God showed up, the God that created the heavens and the earth, he could fix that house. But the health department said, the building department said, the code enforcement people said, short of a divine intervention and an act of God, there's no man can fix this house, tear it down. 
You know what God said? If you don't believe on Jesus Christ, you're condemned already. A priest can't fix you, a pastor can't fix you, a rabbi can't fix you, a shrink can't fix you, you can't fix yourself. There is no man living that can repair the damage sin has done. But Jesus, see, if Jesus would walk through that neighborhood and the power by which he hung the sun, moon, and stars, he just said to that house, be fixed. There it is. He could do that. And Jesus Christ could take your life, he took my life with all the sin that was in it, and in a moment of time, he said, I can fix that. I can fix that. And he did. Look at, back to Romans, back to Romans, one more verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. I was condemned. I'm not condemned. Why? Well, here's why. I agreed that the judgment of God was against sin. I agreed that I had sinned. I agreed that that sin was against God. And instead of pretending like God didn't care or God was never going to do anything about it, I came to Him and asked for salvation. I am guilty. I am a sinner. I have broken your rules. I have judged other people for doing things that I do myself all the time. I'm so guilty. Would you forgive me? Would you save me? And God said, it's so true, it's written in his word. It wasn't some audible voice. I didn't need one. He put it in writing. He said, I thought you'd never ask. I thought you'd never ask. I didn't want to condemn you. You condemned yourself. I didn't want to sentence you to hell. You were going to jump in on your own. But when you agreed with me that sin should be judged and you came to me for mercy, I decided to have mercy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. So, my friend, whether you've been here for years or you're just stopping by, please don't let the religion of this modern society fool you. Amen. God has some right and wrong. And God's against the beams and the splinters. He's against the big four by fours and he's against the little tiny moats. And you are too in the other person. You just need to get against them in you. And when you get as against your sins as you are against the other person's sins, you're going to try and find somebody to forgive them. Because you don't want them judged by God. You want them forgiven by God. And that person is Jesus Christ. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? He can do it. He's merciful if you'll let him be merciful. If you won't let him be merciful, he'll have to deal with you in wrath and judgment. That's not a good thing. So, Let's get to Jesus as quick as we can. If you don't know him, please get that settled today. Amen. Father, thank you for giving us the Bible. Clear, plain, simple truths put in our language where we can understand them to help us escape this careless generation that has so misrepresented you, so confused people about judgment. And Father, help us to move out of the condemnation side of the ledger and into the no condemnation side of the ledger by agreeing with you and trusting your Son, Jesus Christ. In His name we do pray. Amen. Let's stand